Welcome to Chapter 3, Mothers and Daughters of the Revolution, 1750 to 1800. It was the shot heard round the world. The American Revolution had begun. The revolution, with its fight for freedom and liberty, the right to representation um, it, with the colonists, affected women of all spectrums. But in order to understand uh, the revolution and its effects, we have to begin with the background. The background to the revolution was the French and Indian War. Multiple times the French and the British fought for power in Europe and also in North America. By 1754, fighting broke out for the fourth time between the English and their Native American allies and the French and their Native American allies. At the end of the day, it was a British victory over France. The French and Indian War ended with the Treaty of Paris, in which Great Britain gained Canada and all French lands east of the Mississippi River, except for New Orleans. Let me get my pointer out. So here, Great Britain claims, okay, they, they received that land, as well as um, again, Canada as well. France only received this little semi-enclosed circle of sea, which was an outlet to the Atlantic, and that was known as the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And that would be um, essentially in this region, north of Nova Scotia. That's all that they retained. Um, just for clarification, Spanish were also involved in this on the side of the French. They were allies, and they received everything essentially um, here, which is west of the Mississippi. The fall of the French Empire in North America uh, meant a couple of things. The French hated the British for their victory. Also, the Treaty of Paris that ended the French and Indian War made Great Britain the major imperial power in North America, if not the world, and removed France from that equation. However, the aftermath of the war curtailed any celebration that the British had because there was a lot of debt after the war that had to be paid off. Well, who was going to pay that financial debt? You know, take a wild guess. None other. This led to a lot of anger and a lot of resentment of the British crown. And so that, that famous phrase, no taxation without representation extolled by the Sons of Liberty, was shouted so loudly because of these unbelievable duties and taxes that were imposed upon them without their say. So, uh, you know, I'm going to give you a quick little rundown of each act and, and what it meant. Um, again, brief overview, but just be aware that, you know, whatever you learned in U.S. history in high school and middle school, um, hopefully it was emphasized that the colonists... Um, you know, fa famous Sons of Liberty, like Sam Adams, for example, um, you know, yelling, fighting for their say, their representation. Here they had the mother country over the seas telling them what to do, and they had no vote. They had no representation. Today, um, you know, hopefully if you're you're, you have all the qualifications and you're a citizen, you can vote for your representation in government. You can vote for president and so on and so forth. Um, they did not have that say. And furthermore, it was such an odd situation if you really think about it. These colonists that we know traveled over the high seas 
um, during this very tumultuous time to, to start their own and establish their own colonies in North America, everything was unknown. It was just unknown. And here they were starting uh, their own home and populating it. And over time you have these 13 colonies and yet they have the mother country still telling them what to do. They didn't have their own government yet uh, in North America. Um, so it was just an odd situation because the colonists were British. And again, they, they should have had their say, right? So very quickly, the Revenue Act put duties on foreign goods. For example, sugar, coffee, um, and other really hot commodities of the day. We have the Stamp Act... Um, which put um, pay for stamps on items like wills, uh, land deeds, college diplomas, and the list went on, um, and it was very pricey. Um, last but not least, and please understand I'm giving you just a brief overview of these different acts. The Tea Act of 1773 um, bypassed the colonial merchants who were selling tea by making imported tea much cheaper. So the colonial merchants selling the tea felt like they were gypped out of business, out of people buying from them, because it was better to buy it from different a different venue in which imported tea was cheaper. Furthermore, we have the Sons of Liberty uh, who were really upset, and they were really upset especially by these acts, but especially by the Tea Act, because, again, there was no representation. They had no say. Um, so we have the Sons of Liberty, which was organized and founded by the 13 colonies to protect civil liberties and rights. And... Um, we have very famous members, one of them being Sam Adams, uh, John Hancock, even Benedict Arnold, and the list goes on. But the, the Sons of Liberty rallied together. They got together, led by Sam Adams. They went to the Boston Harbor, and what they did was they went on to three ships and dumped this imported tea over into the Boston Harbor. So all of these uh, chests full of the tea that was worth a lot of money was just destroyed by the Sons of Liberty um, as kind of like, uh, like a rebellion against the British Crown. Well, safe to say, the British were not happy. Okay, so the King was not happy. And so... The British Crown in 1774 passed the Intolerable Acts, and this was meant to punish the colonists. It was meant to reimpose strict British law over the American colonies. So it did a number of things. For example, they closed the Boston Harbor so there could be no trade of tea. And just to go back really quickly, Tea was another very hot commodity. Everybody was drinking tea. Um, so, you know, today, whether it's tea, whether it's coffee, today you have Starbucks, you got your Dunkin' Donuts, you're going to go for your special macchiato with the, the foam on top over at Starbucks, give me a venti. I don't even remember which sizes mean what, but okay. You get the point. Even today, something like coffee is a hot commodity. Well, back then, whether it was coffee, especially tea was a hot commodity. Wow, this was a big deal. Okay, so Intolerable Acts really meant to punish the colonists. This Intolerable Acts was like the pinnacle. It was, it, it was the, the end of everything. It exploded. And so it led to the first... Continental Congress meeting of 1774, um, which was leading up to the um, the start of the American Revolution and this 
unbelievable concept of breaking away from the mother country and and getting into this concept of possibly having the colonists be on their own and have their own government. Okay, so yes, there were the Sons of Liberty. There were also the Daughters of Liberty. The Daughters of Liberty were the wives of these activist men. Um, and so they were, they were there to do their duty, their patriotic duty, and help out the cause uh, concerning liberty, the right to representation, and so on and so forth. So the Daughters of Liberty did a multitude of things to boycott British goods. Um, making their own products at home instead of buying British goods uh, was typically the things that they did. So on the next slide I'm getting to, you're going to li uh, listen to a song that embodies the boycott of British goods. So let me go to the next slide. Okay, so this song, Addressed to the Ladies, is sung, and I'm going to play it for you now, but you have the lyrics in front of you. Um, we're going to listen, and then we're going to kind of like talk about what this is about. Here we have this political cartoon entitled A Society of Patriotic Ladies. The background to this is that we have 51 women of North Carolina and they actually signed a declaration supporting the non-importation of British goods, specifically tea. Um, the artist must have opposed their actions because it's a satire. Let me switch to my pointer. So here you have a promiscuous woman with uh, a man hitting on her. Here you have, I don't, I don't want to be rude, but she is not the prettiest of women, um, acting very unfeminine because she's holding a gavel. See the gavel? That's not ladylike. Oh my heavens, they're neglecting their children. The poor child is 
on the floor. He's being licked by the dog. They're not paying attention. Um, they're, they're fooling around back here. They're acting very silly. Um, and so this, this cartoon, again, shows that there were different views of women who were activists, and obviously this one devalued these specific So women found different ways of helping out with the war effort, whether it was boycotting British goods here from the domestic sphere, or going out into the outer sphere, or in the, I'm sorry, into the public sphere, like the camp followers. So we have these camp followers, and they were uh, usually the wives of the soldiers that would follow along during the battle, <clears throat> and they were responsible for making food for the men, for nursing the men, um, and to be honest with you, there were even some camp follower females that acted as prostitutes. Um, there were different views of the camp followers. In one respect, camp followers were given praise, like Molly Pitcher, who we'll talk about in a second. Um, but there were other views of these camp followers as being a distraction and undercutting the, the public image of this victorious army. So I just mentioned Molly Pitcher. Um, you, I assume you've heard of Molly Pitcher, her actual name, Mary Ludwig Hayes McCulley, and here she is down below at the cannon firing away. Um, she was known to bring a pitcher over to the men who were battling and giving them water when her husband collapsed, um, whether it was because of illness or because it was too hot out. She took over and she went out to battle and took control of the cannon. Um, because of what she had done when the battle ended, George Washington rewarded Molly Pitcher by making her a non-commissioned officer and by giving her pension. So she was one camp follower who was definitely praised for her actions. Um, we have someone else known as Deborah Sampson. She called herself Robert Shirtliff. So please, when we're in the lecture, when you're in the textbook, when you're working with, um, if you're assigned the magazine project and you choose her to talk about, don't get confused. Deborah Sampson um, had actually cross-dressed throughout her life and called herself or assumed the, the masculine qualities of a man, even in title, even in name. She took the name Robert Shirtleff. Um, so if you ask me, well, why did she do this? I would have to say, I mean, I believe it's because she was a bit of a tomboy, um, but also because it was a man's world and it was easier to be accepted back then by doing such a thing. So she had done this even when she was young. She started out as an indentured servant and she cross-dressed. She made herself look like a man. And it was so shocking that when she went to church, the church actually kicked her out because it was seen as blasphemy. By age 18, she was independent of anyone controlling her. She was no longer an indentured servant. She wasn't married to a man, and she had no father to watch over her. The freedom that she had allowed her to move from place to place, and she took on different hats or different roles. She was sometimes a teacher, sometimes she would weave, but she's most famous for serving as a soldier in the 4th Massachusetts Regiment. Um, she had been wounded several times during the war, but made it out safe. She, again, she assumed the role of a man. She looked, she dressed like a man. She took on the name Robert Shirtliff. Um, and shortly after the war, she married, she had kids, 
and later on in life she became a lecturer and this really cracks me up because she dressed in her soldier uniform she carried her musket and she gave public talks about her military service and even performed gun drills here we have this down below um, this portrait of Deborah Sampson and to me this is funny because it really doesn't reflect her true character look at her uh, down here she looks like this very pious um, I guess you would say pure young very feminine woman the, the man uh, who wrote the book, The Female Review, his name, Herman Mann, um, actually commissioned this as the, the front of his book, this, this uh, uh, portrait of Deborah Sampson. And throughout the book, he tried not to focus on anything which pertained to her looking masculine. Instead, he showed her as this pious, chaste young woman who was patriotic in her deeds. So what do you think Deborah Samson would think of the book and um, of this portrait of her? That's something that you should think about in your discussion for the, the discussion board. I also want to take note or have you take note that um, Working from the domestic sphere to help out with the patriotic cause was a safe place. Going out into the public sphere um, and taking arm, you know, right alongside the other men was very rebellious and was not always viewed um, um, as a thing of praise. Okay, so I want you to know that women like Mary uh, Molly Pitcher and Deborah Sampson um, were few, um, but they they existed and they did what they did. So let's shift for a second. Um, one of the learning objectives pertains to how did the revolution um, shape. Uh, or change or affect women of different spectrums. Well, we're going to look at the spectrum of the Native American women and the impact that it had on the tribes. American forces um, during the American Revolution were stomping into Native American held territory, destroying crops, and taking over land. This was true of the Iroquois territory. The same was true for the Cherokees. The government uh, at the time was making efforts to encourage Native Americans to assimilate to white norms. And the same was true of those Christian missionaries that we talked about from previous lectures. This disturbed the traditional place of the Native American men and women. So I feel that if you look b below you, you'll see the changing gender roles in this depiction of a U.S. agent looking to um, the, this is the Creek people, looking to the Creek men in which he's introducing the plow for the first time, um, which they did not use in their farming techniques. And he has his back turned to the Creek women with their crops that they had gathered. Because, long story short, you have um, these, these um, colonists who felt that they were better then, okay? So they felt they were superior, and they felt like the Native, Native American men should take on the traditional role of um, acting uh, more masculine in the dominated area, giving up hunting, and switching to agriculture, and that women should switch to the domestic sphere instead of doing what they were doing out in the field. Um, you know, that wasn't their role. 
um, they had to give up raising crops to be more domestic. So continuing on with our, our lecture of um, the American Revolution, after the Revolutionary War in 1781, a weak Articles of Confederation that was passed in that year, um, which was leading up to the passing of the U.S. Constitution in 1788, um, which essentially, long story short, was setting up the frameworks for this experimental government of the United States. And it allowed for the precedence of having a president instead of a king that was tyrannical with the inauguration of George Washington in the year 1789. Um, so I know that we've kind of done this mishmash of the American Revolution. Um, because this is the history of women, I feel that you, you should have an idea of what the American Revolution was about and the hallmarks of it from previous knowledge and also from the textbook. Um, our focus more so are these women that were affected by the revolution and um, what they did during it and how it affected them afterwards. So let's keep going with our lecture. Well, <laughs> ha ha ha, this was all the American Revolution and the Constitution focused on freedom, on rights, on equality, but for who? Was it for men? Was it for women? Was it for white people? Was it for everybody, no matter what race? Was it for slaves? Well, a lot of women question this. Slaves question this. Um, and so we're going to see parallels with our lecture going forward, um, using these these concepts of freedoms, right and equality, rights and equalities that were presented in the Constitution later on the Bill of Rights um, by women of of different spectrums. So, who questioned their their rights? Well, in the North. We have the example of Mum Bet. Later on, she took on the name of Elizabeth Freeman. And sh here she is, um, here, to the left of the screen. So, Mum Bet um, was a slave woman. She was born into slavery. And she had served as a slave alongside her sister. Um... Mumbet had run away from her slave owners and the slave owners were trying to get her back because she ran away. Well, Mumbet was very, very wise. She had listened very carefully while wealthy men she served to were talking about the Bill of Rights and the new state constitution. She heard about the concepts of people being born free and equal, and she felt that this applied to her. She uh, researched, she found a lawyer, and she sued. She actually sued for her freedom, and she won the lawsuit. She won against her, her own slave owner. She won her freedom, and because of this, her slave owner had to pay um, certain money back to her, and the case was a precedent that it ultimately led to the abolition of slavery in Massachusetts. So that is unbelievable. Not only did Mum Bet win her freedom in the court by using these concepts from the Bill of Rights and the, the Constitution, but she also set the precedent to abolish slavery in Massachusetts. So while the North, we have this North versus South that we're going to come back to again and again and again. 
Um, again, I'm giving a generalization, but while the North, slowly but surely, was leaning a little bit less towards slavery, this was very, very much untrue of the South. The South was becoming more and more so more dependent on, on slavery. And partly during this time period um, of the later part of the 18th century, we can say, you know, why did slavery expand? Well, part of the reason is because of the invention of the cotton gin. The cotton gin was this invention that um, basically made the process of removing seeds from cotton more uh, uh, quicker, more productive, and more profitable. So because of this, more slave, more, um, excuse me, more slaves were, were needed for the, for the labor end because cotton was such a hot commodity. And, um, you know, it was, it was something that became more entrenched Slave owners in the South became more entrenched in the slave, in the slave uh, um, business because of this. And we see, and if you know from your history classes and from the textbook, that um, over time, slavery was, okay, you purchase the slave, but then the slave woman that had the child, that child was born into slavery. Um... And so it was, it was able, it was cheap because here you bought the slave and then you forced or the slave owners forced the slaves to reproduce and then have basically a free slave baby. So just as Mum Bet used these concepts from the Constitution to question rights and freedom, so too did Abigail Adams. So Abigail Adams, throughout the time of her husband serving and um, trying to frame the Constitution, his name John Adams, I hope you know that, um, she was writing these letters to him about different uh, concepts and topics. And one of them, uh, here I have below the where you can find it, the March 31st, 1776 letter to her husband, um, I use this quote, remember all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Wow, no voice or representation for the ladies. That sounds familiar to you, right? No taxation without representation. No, you know, representation was all about being represented, the colonists being represented. And now so after the revolution in which the colonists won, they wanted representation in their government. So in conclusion, Abigail Adams was an advocate of, of women. Um, women, she believed were, should be seen in the eyes of um, men, you know, they should be included and have rights and equality and liberty just like men. And she wanted her husband to remember this while he was framing the government. And the fact that she wrote down, um, you know, men would be tyrants just like you had the king, the British king, that was seen as a tyrant, and there, you know, men's view of women at this time, um, for the most part, was that they should be in the domestic sphere. And so she wanted to show that it was important to remember the ladies and that they should have rights just like any men would. Do you want, as a man, to be a tyrant like the British king? Or do you want us to be remembered as well? So another food for thought, um, and this will be included in the, in the discussion board, but how do you think Abigail and John, what kind of relationship did they have? 
the fact that she could write such a thing in her letter to him, um, what did that say about their marriage? Again, we see this theme of, um, the theme of showing this parallel of, um, the Constitution and the concepts of freedom and rights with Mumbet, with Abigail Adams, but also with Phyllis Wheatley. Wheatley had been a slave, but she was unusual because the family that took her in um, took a liking to her and taught her how to read, how to write. She became educated, and later she was known for her famous writings and especially her poems. So here I, I quoted, um, and this is in your textbook on page 143, I quoted one of her poems that was dedicated to the British Secretary of State. So I'm going to read it, and then we're going to draw um, parallels of what this means. Or, an, oh, sorry, analyze what this means. No more America in mournful strain of wrongs and grieve, grieve, sorry, of wrongs and grievance, sorry about that, unredressed complain, no longer shalt thou dread the iron chain, which wanton tyranny with lawless hand had made. And with it meant to enslave the land, should you, my lord, while you peruse my song, wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung, whence flow these wishes for the common good, by feeling hearts alone understood, I, young in life, seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Afric's fancied happy seat. Africa, you get that right? Okay. What pangs excruciating must molest? What sorrows labor in my parents' breast? Still it was that soul and by no misery moved, that from a father seized his baby, his babe beloved, such, such my case. And can I then but pray, others may never feel tyrannic sway. In other words, she was trying to draw this parallel between the American colonists fighting for their freedom to break away from the chains of their slavery from Great Britain, um, their master. And she tried to draw this parallel of her people and their experience and her experience of slavery. And she's begging the British Secretary of State to, uh, to, to remove the chains of slavery and this tyranny. In your textbook, you'll see um, a section of the chapter dedicated to the concept of Republican motherhood. And so this was an ideal or a view that, that most of society, especially the men, felt that women should have. Republican motherhood meant that a woman was chaste and pious, um, delicate, very Christian, and patriotic from the domestic sphere. Well, this was even embodied in um, the civic ideals and promises of freedom in popular allegories that displayed Lady Liberty as a young female. And here we have her um, draped in a long flowing gown. So here's her long flowing gown. She is feeding um, uh, or nourishing the Republic in the symbolic form of an eagle. Um, and she also has broken the chains uh, of slavery from the mother country, that of Great Britain. Um, and you see the American flag in the back flying high. So this concept of Lady Liberty, it's a she. It's a she. It's not man liberty, it's Lady Liberty. Um, why? Why Lady Liberty? You tell me. You think about it. Maybe you can bring it into the discussion board and we can kind of work off of it. 
here we have a very un unusual display of Lady Liberty um, and this was created in 1792. It was an oil canvas painting by the artist Samuel Jennings. So the background to this is that the Library Company of Philadelphia, which was a private library founded by Benjamin Franklin in the mid-18th century, commissioned a work to depict the figure of Lady Liberty um, displaying the arts and knowledge to uh, these slave people. So here she is. Um, she is giving knowledge. These books are given to, in the books, um, you know, displaying symbols of knowledge and learning are being given to these uh, black slave men and women. They are kneeling, they are happy, they are thankful. There's more in the background. Um, and that is because they are receiving this knowledge. Um, they are celebrating, and most of, our, most of all, they're thanking and praising Lady Liberty because she has given them their emancipation or their freedoms from slavery. The chains of slavery have been broken. So the connection here that I don't feel is really shown in your textbook is that, and again and again we'll come back to this, question, what did women and what did, um, what did white women who were free and what did black women who were slaves, um, not all slaves, but you know, some of them slaves, what did they have in common? What was going on during this revolution or after the revolutionary period? What is the connection there? So the connection is that these white women, although technically free, in a sense, were slaves because they were not represented in the Constitution. And the same, the same for the black slave women who literally were enslaved and had masters and were abused in many ways. Um, they, they wanted their freedom. They wanted to be recognized in the Constitution. There is a connection. There is a common ground. So keep that in mind as we go through the years and we continue with our lectures to come. So in conclusion, So in conclusion, the American Revolution affected women of all spectrums. In one sense, the societal expectation was for women's activities to be filtered through the domestic sphere. So whether it was slave women acting as nurses, acting as maids within the slave owner home, whether it was Native American women that were expected to remain in the domestic sphere and not in the outer sphere, or even um, some of these patriotic, white, free, elite ladies who helped the patriotic cause from the domestic sphere, like, for example, sewing um, clothes for the soldiers and so on and so forth. Yet, we have this dynamic of the revolution also affecting women in untraditional ways. So if you look at um, uh, Mumbet, who was able to successfully, successfully sue for her freedom, or if you look at the white woman perspective in which Deborah Sampson took on the uh, role of a man and served in the war, or you look at the Native American women. Now, I didn't actually put this in the lecture. It's in your textbook, and it's a part of um, the discussion board. But we have the Native American Women Council, in which they actually spoke up and deliberated over what was their place and their rights. Um, and they tried to resist the 
the loss of their culture. So again, in many ways, the, the revolution and its dramatic events affected women in a wide variety of ways. So now that you've listened to the song, um, can you figure out how the song was connected to boycotting British goods? Hopefully you can. Um, so the women were encouraged in the song to boycott the British goods and use substitutes produced by themselves. Uh, look right here. To, to show clothes of your own, make and spinning. Make your own clothes. Um, other things they did was boycott sugar, 